Hello and welcome to our program, Where God Weeps, a program where we talk about the situation of the suffering church around the world. Today we're going to be considering the Diocese of Sokoto in northeast Nigeria, in particular the work of the new bishop there, Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka, and his work for peace and reconciliation. Your Excellency, thank you for being with us here today in our program. Thank you very much, Mark. My great pleasure. Your Excellency, your diocese encapsulates some 16 million, of which approximately 44,000 are Catholics. So you are a very much a minority church. What is the reality of Catholics living in your diocese? Well, you know, I'd like you to imagine if those 44,000 were 45 or 44,000 candles lit. Uh, it would be some great light. Um, and because of our numerical, seeming numerical disadvantage, what we have tried to do and what we continue to seek to do is to be witnesses to the values of the gospel that focus on our common humanity. Now, strange as it may sound, despite our seeming numerical disadvantage, our impact is quite huge. We run a school in one of the states that make up Sokoto Diocese, which is Kasina State. There are three other states, Kebi, Zamfara, and Sokoto itself. But our school in, uh, in Kasina State has always come tops in the national examinations for that state. And of course, they are Muslim and Christian and students. And exactly. And uh, in Zamfara State, where Sharia was first started, We've been for almost 50 years uh, running, if not the best primary school. So we may not have the numbers, but our impact and our light has been lit by millions of other people. Would you say that the, the, fact, that you, the fact that you are a minority actually is, gives greater credence or greater commitment, if you will? There is a greater commitment. The light is brighter, although there are, so f there are relatively few. The light is brighter because of the commitment of the faith of the Catholics yes. living in your area. Yes, we are we are minority, but we are also Catholic, yeah. and that set us apart because we come from a very long tradition of uh, of learning. You, if I might say, are an intellectual. You are an author of two books. You have written many many articles. You are fluent in many languages in uh, many Nigerian languages. Pope Benedict appointed you bishop of Sokoto Diocese. What was your reaction when you heard? I've been nominated to be a bishop. Well, it was actually a shock, one, for, you know, and for many reasons, but I'll tell you some of the reasons. The first is that I have been, quote unquote, making noise in Nigeria for a very long time, for over 30 years, um, without being immodest. If you call my name, the average person living in Nigeria will know. So I had, if you like, lost my innocence. Let me put it that way. Troubled the waters. I, I had, yes, I had been, I had been, I had been quite troublesome, but in a very positive way. And I thought, more or less, I had written myself out of disqualified the disqualified. Let, let me put it that it's not not a conscious decision, but the things I love to do were to do my work as a priest, but also to talk and to, 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 I travel around the world and I've been doing it for a very long time. Um, I'm interested in, in, in intellectual engagement. And that really was, those, those were the kind of issues I had already decided to commit myself to. And when I finished my term, after almost 10 years in the Catholic Secretariat, I went to Oxford for, for two years as a senior road scholar. And then I, went, I was interested in understanding the issues of church and state. And I went to the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. I spent one year. And I came back to Nigeria prepared to start up a research center, you know, to deal with issues of church and state relations. So um, for me, it came as a bit of a shock. But 
coming from the Holy Father. It was not something you could, I mean, first of all, you have to recover from it. Yes. You know, and say, well, if the Holy Father thinks that I am worthy, I'm capable of this job, I signed on and I took a vow of obedience. So I couldn't afford the luxury of wondering whether it is something that I'll be prepared to do or not. But do you think it's an affirmation of your outspoken nature? That is, do you feel yourselves, do yourself more restrained by this new position or new situation? Or is it an affirmation, if you will, a larger platform for, through which you can share your concerns, your ideas, your proposals and your vision? When I look at it, I, is it an affirmation? I said yes, because I thought maybe uh, it is an appreciation. And I now so, suddenly notice that I'm standing on a much higher pedestal and that perhaps the issues that we've been talking about, issues of justice, issues of equality, issues of the fact that this, is, this world is big enough, it can take all of us, and that religion really ought not to be a source of conflict and war. Um, and that we as Catholics are coming to the table with a rich tradition that we can offer the rest of the world. So, and luckily for me, I have also studied Nigeria because my PhD thesis was on power politics in Nigeria. So I appreciate politics and I also appreciate the sociology of politics. So it's placed me in a very good position in which more or less I'm, I feel quite comfortable talking about the church and very comfortable talking about my country. Your name is Matthew Hassan. Matthew, the Christian name, Hassan, the Muslim name. And how does this come about, this, these two names? Right. For I you? mean, it's, it's uh, again, you know, you look back with gratitude to God. I grew up with uh, my, my father and my grandfather before my father was, you know, he had an extraordinary relationship with Muslims who were just traveling through our village. And when I grew up, there was a, always a guest house. My father was, was not a rich man. But we had an extra room because our house was at the end of the village. And whenever these travelers, these itinerant Muslim traders would come, they would stay you know, with my father. And my father became a Christian only much later in life. But I could never understand why he never became a Muslim. But they never talked religion. Um, but they got to trust him. So when I was born, um, there's been a lot of socialization with, you know, with Muslims around us. And, Twins were, were normally called, if, one is, if there are two boys, one is Hassan, one is Hussein. If it's a girl, then one is Hassan, one is Hassana, as the case may be. My twin brother died at birth. So it was almost natural that I would be called Hassan. Your Excellency, you are now the bishop of the Sokoto Diocese, which is the diocese with the highest uh, illiteracy, as well as one of the poorest areas in Nigeria. Can you tell us what do you understand, or rather, can you give us a picture so that we can better understand what does poverty mean in your diocese? Poverty of the type that we have in Nigeria uh, is disheartening because it disfigures the face of Christ. Uh, but perhaps what is even more painful is that we ought not to be poor. Because had we been less endowed with land, even before you talk about oil, um, had we been less endowed, then we probably will have a reason to hold a grudge against God. But God has given us agrarian land. He's given us incredible resources. As at the last count, there are over 120 or 200 different uh, minerals buried in, in the nooks and crannies of Nigeria. As I'm talking to you now, only last month, the governor of Sokoto announced the discovery of oil in Sokoto. I don't know whether that, is, uh, that has been scientifically verified or not. But to answer your question, the reason why the poverty in Nigeria is totally and absolutely unacceptable, whether it's at, at, as economics or as sociology or as theology, is simply because God has done so much for us. And the challenge that somebody like myself faces, and it's again one of the things that has made me so, so angry uh, and why I take very seriously the issues of how we ought to create a just and equitable society. Because there's no other way we can close the gap of violence. It's absolutely no way. Had we been a much more prosperous society, we'll not be having this conversation about Christians and Muslims. Most of what you have in Nigeria called violence, whether it's kidnapping, whether it's Boko Haram, whether it's assassinations, it's all a reaction of the frustrations that ordinary Nigerians feel against how badly their state has treated them. A question to you quickly is, 
oil and the mineral discoveries a curse or a blessing for the country? I mean, oil for many countries around the world has actually been a curse because the government doesn't know how to manage and, and corruption is promoted, etc., etc. What is your understanding? I know, I've never believed in the notion of a curse because there's nothing God can give you that can be a curse, you know. I mean, if God makes you handsome and you become arrogant, then that's, that's your business. Clearly, oil could never have been a curse. But again, the problems of minerals and poverty in developing countries, it's not just about the developing countries having bad people. It's also about multinational corporations. It's also about the international community. It's also about the capacity you know, of the multinational corporations to do what is right. I have worked, as I said, I, was, I, I worked for, 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 for about seven years just trying to deal with the problems in and the, negotiate. In Niger, yes, in the, in yes, the Niger Delta. To deal with the problems and to end, you know, the, 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 the violent, I mean, the conflict between Shell mm. and Ogoni. We, I mean, it's only about a year ago that the United Nations Agency for Environment released the report. The report is a damning indictment on the oil companies themselves. It may be Shell, but you can say the same of other oil companies. So to come to, to see oil as a curse in Nigeria is actually to mistake the symptom for the disease. Because the real disease is the sense of uh, uh, the inability of oil companies, of multinational corporations, of the international community and the politicians who benefit, whether they are in Europe or America, because it is the extraction of the resources from developing countries that drives politics and economics and everything else in Western nations. So um, for us to square the cycle, I think it is important that we all come to terms with the reality that we all want the same thing as human beings. Everybody wants dignity. Everybody wants to be able to raise their family in peace. Every, we all want the same thing, irrespective of gender or skin color. So, and I think this is, these are some of the things that some of us are pushing. And for us as Christians, we are actually better placed precisely because Jesus himself said, this is the reason why he came. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. My responsibility is to convince the government and people of Nigeria that whether you're Christian or Muslim, Jesus came to offer you a full life. And if you don't have that full life, it's an indictment on the state, but it's not a curse because what God gave you was never meant to be a curse. Now, you've been speaking about the international uh, companies and their impact on Nigeria, but the politics is local. The corruption is local. The education of many of Nigerians have passed through Catholic schools. Where have Catholic schools fallen down in not educating the leaders, the future leaders of Nigeria in the ills of corruption and, and where is this breaking down? Well, we must also be, be fair about the church itself. Okay. I mean, it's like a good father. You raise your children. You do the best you can. You teach them how to pray. But if you throw them into a world that is hostile to the principles that you've you know, try to impact onto them, it will be difficult for anybody to hold you responsible. Similarly, the church is not an alternative to the state. The church has been able to turn out its children to serve the state. Now, my argument is, and I'm not making an excuse, I've never made an excuse for the political elite in Africa, but I also know that the international community is not as, in, it's, it's not as innocent. Mm. And I give you a simple example. Most of the resources stolen from Nigeria they are in banks in Europe, they are, whether it's London or Paris or New York. And the presidents know, and the people who run the, the bureaucrats, everybody knows. To the extent that you are, you are not prepared to return what is mine to me, it will, when, when we are told to hold our leaders accountable, what are we going to use to hold our leaders accountable? Because the same corrupt leaders, Mentality. yes, the same corrupt leaders that are stealing our resources, if you're prepared to receive items of theft, mm. then you are a collaborator. And I believe that the day that the international community decides that it will take the side of ordinary people in Nigeria, it will take the side of civil society in Nigeria, and that it will say no, to whether it's blood diamonds today or blood oil tomorrow, I think the conversation will change. And I think that we can also come to the point by saying, well, we thank God we are now in a democracy, in a country like Nigeria. It has given us, it hasn't given us what we dreamt of, but also we have not had a nightmare. Yes. 
And I think that what we need now, and it's one of the things we continue to encourage our people, to be patient with the system, you know, to keep on this path because we will never develop outside the democratic model. We, will, we can never develop on that. We cannot contemplate returning to military rule or to any form of dictatorship. But, as you say, the Niger Delta is one example which you have managed to calm. Boko Haram is another example of the frustration of the people who have said, we can't wait anymore. For example, if I understand correctly, Boko Haram didn't start out as a violent organization. It was a protest. It was, perhaps you can correct me, but now Boko Haram has taken a violent approach. It is bombing government institutions, police stations, and churches because it's good for media uh, uh, approach. So um, how long will the pe people be patient in waiting for this, uh, for this uh, time to come? Well, the people are not, are not as it were, in suspension. Uh, we are agents of our own development. And the government is not President Jonathan. The government is not a political party. We're not, uh, we're not being acted upon as if we're innocent. Okay, President Jonathan did not drop from heaven. We voted for him. And the beauty of democracy, and we have to understand that democracy is not about voting. It's not about political parties. Democracy is also about processes. And part of that is to exercise the mental discipline, to have the patience to wait. Okay, Brazil lost the World Cup. It has to wait until after four years. Another four you, years. <laughs> another four years. So we have to learn that if you lose, you'll have to wait. And one of the beauties of, the, of, of choosing is that you can always choose wrongly. So I think that the first thing for Nigerians to begin to appreciate is that Jonathan is not a magician. No president is ever going to be a magician. But we must be patient. And within that patience, not confuse the voices of the opposition who want to take over power at all costs with what the principles of governance ought to be. And I'm not excusing Jonathan, but I'm also aware of the fact that he did not cause the problems we face in Nigeria. So part of the thing we need to be able to teach our people is to appreciate the fact that we need to begin to imbibe the principles of democracy in our personal lives, in our family life, in our schools, in our churches, because that is the only way that you, know, you can hope to build a better society. Now, Boko Haram, to touch on this a bit more, has become a juggernaut that has taken a life of its own. Um, as I mentioned, attacking churches and police stations and government institutions. What is Boko Haram and what is the answer to Boko Haram? Uh, it seems to want to be the Al-Qaeda of Africa. Well, you know, it is very interesting that you ask that question. You remember September 11 happened. In October of that year, so an American uh, theoretician, Farid Zakarias, published an article in Newsweek. And the title of the article is, Why Do They Hate Us? And I think that was one of the major efforts at articulating what, Niger what Americans were not thinking about. Because Americans assume we're all good people. We've not done anything to anybody. But he tried to answer, the, why do these people hate us? And I think that we in Nigeria have not had the patience to ask, why have these people, are, are these people behaving in this way? Now, I think all of us have just agreed that, you know, this is a bunch of useless people. They are trying to destroy our country. They are trying to destroy our democracy. And people are confusing it and talking about Jonathan is a Christian or Jonathan, they want Jonathan out. This is not what it's all about. This, in my view, this is not what it's all about. The first thing is that we've not been able to diagnose the disease properly. And because we haven't diagnosed the disease, we're treating a symptom, not the disease. I'm not saying because I know, but I think that the kind of painstaking reflection and analysis that the government of Nigeria ought to have embarked on, we've not done that. The result is that we started off seeing Boko Haram as an anti-Jonathan, uh, as a reaction. And we ended up blaming people who actually ended up becoming the victims. And then we now began to say it is, it is Muslims attacking Christians. Mm. Then we've now woken up to the fact that only last week now, the guys have gone and blown up uh, masks A mosque. Of, of the various, the various telecommunication uh, companies. They have attacked hotels. They have attacked mosques. They have attacked uh, sports uh, centers. They have attacked, they, they, they don't believe in anything. 
What that tells you is what some of us have been saying for a very long time. We've got an evil in the, um, we've, got, we've got some, some, a, some a evil. Cancer, a cancer. We've got this. a cancer. Mm. And this cancer doesn't have a name. It's not about Islam. It's not about, even if it's Al-Qaeda, Al that's not the issue. And if we don't agree collectively, what we are going to do and what we've been doing is just trading blames. I'm blaming, we are blaming the politicians, the politicians are blaming the North, the North is blaming this. So what I'm saying in effect is that perhaps with a little bit of patience and a proper understanding of what really the issues are, in my view, what we are face, facing and what we are calling Boko Haram, at the end is just a metaphor for expressing frustration. Because clearly you can, there's nothing in what is happening. All the things that have been taking the, 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 the devices that they are using, there's none of those devices that looks like it was made even in Chad or Cameroon. They're all locally manufactured things. What, is, what these things are telling you is that those who are talking of Al-Qaeda or the Taliban and so are probably not getting the, you know, the correct text. It's a local issue. It's a local issue. And what has also happened is that different people with different grudges and different agendas are literally exploding violence, one, to create chaos. But the reasons may be completely different. You have worked, uh, precisely in this question, you have worked closely with the Sultan of Sokoto. Um, his name, I quote here, is uh, uh, Haji Muhammad Saad Abba Saad Abu Bakr. the third. Right. What is your estimation of the man? And what is your intent of working so closely with the Sultan of Sokoto? Well, you know, I believe myself, you know, and I don't want to sound extravagant, but I believe that Sometimes God brings certain people together at a particular point in time. I believe that God has a reason for making me what I am today at this particular point in time and for placing me in Sokoto at a time that the Sultan is, is there. I believe that friendship is a, is, a, is a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition and a guarantee for peace. So we have a great opportunity. And you have a deep friendship with this. We have a, well, I mean, we, we a have a deep friendship. friendship, but also a great sense of respect for one another. We knew one another before. I knew him before he became a sultan. He knew me before I became a bishop. Um, but the point I'm making is it's also important that we understand what Joseph Stalin said. How many divisions has the Pope? We all, the sultan and I, none of us has a prison. None of us has a police force. None of us has a budget for security. So we have only moral voices. But I think it is symbolic that we learn, collectively lend our voices to issues of peace. But in the final analysis, the state, the Nigerian state, that is those, the political class that manages the infrastructure of governance, have to take responsibility for what they are, they are also ordained, I mean, called upon to do. It is the responsibility of the state to apprehend and to punish criminals. And the situation in Nigeria has persisted because the Nigerian state has up till today never really become serious enough about apprehending and punishing criminals, especially those who use the name of religion to kill, to maim, to destroy churches, or to burn mosques. Your Excellency, if we had more time, we'd be using it, but we don't. But I want to thank you. I also want to thank you for all the work that you've been doing in particularly this area of peace. And uh, yes, we pray for you and we ask you also to pray for us. Thank you very much. I will. And I just make a final appeal. The kind of things we're trying to do in Sokoto, my own personal conviction is that, you know, we need to create infrastructures for dialogue. This includes schools, it includes ICT, it includes sports, opening up opportunities for young people. Sokoto, where I live, for example, they are in football pitches, they are in sports facilities. Those are, and, and as long as those kind of things are not available, where young people can interact, uh, so long will we continue to walk on different ends of the street, calling ourselves Christians and Muslims. So, but I, uh, my appeal is that um, you need schools. Yes, we do need schools. Uh, we 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 run in schools, but we don't have the resources to run the kind of effective schools we would like to run because the Catholic Church always has its own bar set pretty high in terms of the quality of education. And actually, my own personal conviction is that we can run the schools of such quality that the young people that will run Nigeria 30, 40, 50 years from now can be free from the prejudices that the, the, you know, the rest of us have, have already imbibed. And the only opportunity they have is to be able to play together, work together, study together, and in that way, you know, we can be sure of a much more stable country.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having been with us today on our program. And if you'd like to know more about the situation of Catholics in northern Nigeria in the Sokoto Diocese, or perhaps how you might be able to help through your prayer or your concrete action, the work of His Excellency, I would ask you to look at the contact information at the end of this program. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.